the same way. To some, neutrality means peace, or at least hope. To others, it is a word behind which armies are hidden, aggressions continued. And still to others, neutrality has come to mean what in fact it is in Laos. War, pain, fear. A relentless and brutal series of events that each year leads the entire kingdom of Laos on an elaborate and costly funeral march towards its own national grave under the interested scrutiny of the world's diplomats. As the North Vietnamese ambassador listens to the funeral prayers just across town at the Royal Army camp, some of his countrymen are less honored. These prisoners are North Vietnamese soldiers captured in Laos, part of the 75,000 North Vietnamese who have invaded the country. About two-thirds of them operate the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The rest, including 15 regular battalions, do most of the fighting in Laos, and have ever since President Kennedy's announcement in 1961. Laos's own communist forces, called the Pathet Lao, number about 24,000. They are not the best soldiers, and without massive North Vietnamese intervention, they probably would not be much of a threat. <laughs> and here we see Pathet Lao soldiers shopping in Vientiane's marketplace. Under the 1962 Geneva Agreements, the Pathet Lao became part of the legal coalition government. The communist leaders soon pulled out and resumed fighting. But Laos being what it is, the Pathet Lao are permitted to do their marketing in the same capital they are trying to conquer. Among the numerous curiosities here in the capital of Laos is this building on my left. This is where the enemy lives, a hundred of them, fully armed and uniformed. How do you do? Say va. Do you, do you speak English? No part of English? Hey, laddie. Are you, are you a path at Lao soldier? What we're trying to do, you see, is show the American public get a good look at the enemy. And I thought perhaps you would come out here and pose for our camera. Do you speak English, uh, my friend? Uh, do, you, do you speak any English? Parlez-vous anglais? Oh, no. No, no, parlez? No. Uh, okay, monsieur. Um, I just wanted to take some pictures. Filmar el soldado, the soldier, for American television. Just let them see what the, uh, the path at Laos soldier. The point that we're trying to make here is that this is the path at Laos. These are our enemies. And they have, uh, in the last year, killed 14,000 Laotian soldiers and civilians. They've practically cut the country in half. Hi, but I... They have, uh, in, adi in addition to all that, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, right. Uh, they've turned the Ho Chi Minh Trail with the help of North Vietnamese regular soldiers into a boulevard, but nonetheless, they enjoy the comparative security of these buildings. They do their shopping across the street in the morning over here in the marketplace. This just points up one of the many Alice in Wonderland aspects of this very peculiar war in Southeast Asia. Okay. What's wrong? Can we? Do you speak English? Parlez, parlez français? Okay. No. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's the problem? The problem, in a nutshell, is that Laos is all mixed up. It has communist, neutralist, and royalist armies, plus the Royal Air Force, which recently bombed Royal Army headquarters. It has a king who can't be crowned because of his fortune tellers. The neutralist army were once part of the Royal Army, then fought against it, but now fight the communists. The communists have their own neutralists, who fight the original neutralists. Laos is a confusion of political solutions that don't work, and guns that do. And it's producing a confused and cynical population of hungry people who, faced by these weird realities, do their utmost to escape from becoming involved. We escape honorably, we thought, through the Geneva Peace Agreements of 1962. Laos was left theoretically neutral, governed by a coalition of neutralists, communists, and conservatives. But the three-headed government never had a chance. When the communists could not dominate it, they wrecked it. 
Theoretically, the war in Laos was settled at the conference table. But in fact, the war goes on, and Laos stands a monument to the failure of a negotiated peace. There hasn't been a successful coup d'etat in the capital of Vientiane in three years. This political feat has been accomplished by Prime Minister Prince Savannah Fuma, whose task it's been to hold the remnants of Laos together and maintain its pretense of neutrality. Formerly a sincere neutralist, his disillusionment in the communist has finally found expression. Altes, would you evaluate the political and military situation in Laos and explain what will be needed, in your view, to restore peace and unity to the kingdom? La situation politique et militaire au Laos the political and military situation in Laos comes from the disrespect for the 1962 Geneva Convention by certain signers. Indeed, the 1962 Geneva Accord prescribed that foreign troops had to withdraw from Laos. On the other hand, an article of the Accord specified distinctly that no signatory power could use the territory of Laos to attack their neighbor. I'm sorry to say, to my regret, I am obliged to declare that North Vietnam never did withdraw its foreign troops and that North Vietnam has continued to use the territory of Laos to go from north to south by what we call the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That is why at this hour my country still finds itself at war because due to the fact that North Vietnam needs this passage across Laos there has not been any political unification. Behind the words is the harsh reality of the forgotten war. In the mountains of northern Laos, this is what the front line looks like. And this is what supports our side of that very lonely war. The only way to supply the isolated, often surrounded guerrilla camps is by plane. This is an Air America caribou bringing ammunition, medicine, food, refugees and wounded into Sam Thong base camp only a few hours march from the nearest North Vietnamese battalion. The Mayos, largest of the Laotian hill tribes, hold Sam Thong, do the bulk of the fighting, and suffer the most. But this is still an American war, fought with American weapons, financed by American dollars, and supported by American planes. Unlike the North Vietnamese, the United States withdrew its military advisors from Laos in 1962 in accordance with the Geneva Agreements. As a result, the major burden of the war has fallen on American civilians. The plane belongs to Air America, operating under a civilian contract to the U.S. government. They fly in and out of a hundred dirt strips, but still, as one pilot put it, the only thing worse than flying in this country is trying to land. Nobody will tell you just how much the war is costing America, but just to keep Air America and similar companies flying cost the United States a reported $10 million a year. Air America operates about 50 aircraft ranging from twin-engine transports to light planes and helicopters. The war and the people depend totally on them. Pilots, mostly veteran bush pilots, earn up to $3,000 a month, and between monsoons, mountains, and North Vietnamese anti-aircraft guns, earn every cent of it. Air America refuses to comment on the number of aircraft losses in over five years of operation. But as a pilot said, on a clear day, which is damn seldom, you can see our planes lying all over these mountains. Here in northern Laos, the friendly Mayo guerrillas hold the mountaintops, but the surrounding valleys are controlled by the communists. Air America is their only link. If it can't be moved by plane, it doesn't move. They carry everything from fresh eggs to the seriously wounded. 
Next to the quagmire they call a runway at Samthong is a 130-bed hospital which the U.S. built and helps operate. This is the first hospital these Mayos ever had. Over half the patients are combat casualties, many from communist landmines. USAID medical facilities treated over 13,000 combat casualties in Laos last year. And that, they say, is only a fraction of the total. Many casualties don't make it to the hospital. Nursing services are scarce, so this Mayo woman stays with her husband. He was wounded by a communist machine gun during a guerrilla raid. Supervising the hospital is a Laotian surgeon, one of the few in the country. He is assisted by an American U.S. aid surgeon, Dr. Robert Jackson. He tells us about his newest patient. He had his arm by his side, went through the arm and into the chest, hit the rib and came back out. He was fortunate in that the bone was not hit. It was a through and through flesh wound. No broken bone here. Most of the sick and wounded at Sam Thong are flown in. Once there, they have a good chance, provided they get there in time. But the enemy, the weather, and a shortage of airplanes all too often makes this impossible, and so they die. <laughs> These are the bitter realities of the conference table neutrality in Laos. But the war goes on and on, advised and assisted by American civilians hopping from one mountaintop to another in light planes. The plane and the pilot are from Air America. The passenger is Jack Williamson, a U.S. aid advisor and veteran of five years of this mountain war. He and five other Americans try and coordinate U.S. help to nearly 100,000 Mayo tribesmen fighting the communists in Laos. He is on his way to a guerrilla outpost deep in enemy territory. They fly near the lush Plain of Jars, a communist stronghold. To avoid its anti-aircraft batteries, they duck through clouds and valleys at treetop level. This is Williamson's objective, a hilltop surrounded by the enemy. It has no name, only a number. 1,800 Mayos, driven from their traditional homeland by the communists, try to survive here. The skateboards are made from the rollers off airdrop supply cases. They do not know what peace is. Shelters from communist mortar and artillery fire are handily located. It is a village caused by and literally built from the war. The Mayo defend themselves with a collection of hand-me-down U.S. weapons, World War II rifles, machine guns, and mortars. The ammunition is flown in by Air America, and as the ammunition is used up, construction in the village increases proportionately. American out of JFK. This was one of Air America's major operation centers until the enemy overran it. The combination of danger, superb flying, and exotic locale, plus a tradition of secrecy, has led to some highly sensational reporting about Air America. Its pilots have been called America's Flying Foreign Legion and the Lord Jims of Laos. What is Air America? Well, it's the same thing today that it always has been, and that is a charter air carrier whose major customer is the United States government. And it's nothing more or less than that. The average age, by the way, is 43 out here, so that they're not a bunch of apple-cheeked youngsters who are looking for big thrills. Most of them already have their thrills. Each season, it gets worse. Uh, as an example, uh, we're, uh, we're within 15 minutes now of an area Last year was like a rest center. This year, as you know, we've already had one airplane shot down. What's the worst thing about flying out here? 
The mountains, the weather, or the bad guy? It's a combination of all three. We have three distinct flying seasons. It's either smoky, windy, or rainy. And uh, any one of the three combined with the uh, enemy uh, creates the situation that none of us like. So you don't really have a happy season? No, it's not. How long do you plan to keep this up? Each year I say it's my last one. This is my seventh year now. What is it that brings you back? Money. No, not really. It's, it's a big influence, of course. Uh, I have two daughters to put through school yet, out of my six. So uh, even though I'm retired, I still have to work. Do you like the guys you work with? Yeah, a real bunch of pros, every one of them. We have an extreme sense of comradeship and a, and a sense of competition that uh, I think is not excelled in uh, any profession. Let's say the U.S. government uh, put, let's say, 500,000 troops into North Vietnam to accomplish the same job that we're accomplishing here with a handful of, uh, so to speak, American professionals. We have a commodity to sell. We can't sell any place in the world except right here. And, and if you want to be, uh, if you just want to be mundane and about it, take this war away, or if we quit, you talk about why we do it. If most of us went back to the United States, we would be a dirty old man. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Jim, you're a dirty old man. Here, what are you talking it. about? <laughs> well, not really. It is a uh, different operation, I think, than you'll find any place in the world. But on the other hand, as far as professional standards go, uh, we do meet the requirements of uh, any major airline, regardless of where it is throughout the world. It is becoming tougher, but uh, it's... It, it hasn't reached the point where we're we're giving up by any stretch of the imagination. All of us are very talented, very, very talented, and we can avoid what they have given us so far, but uh, it is becoming a little more difficult for us to do. We are really uh, all, most, most all, highly experienced, qualified people, and uh, we've gone through this thing before, and it's a thrill. It's a business. It is not a uh, romantic, devil-may-care operation. We carry a lot of wounded people. And if we weren't there to carry them, they'd die. And about the time you participated in some of these uplifts of seriously wounded men, uh, you get the feeling that there's a reason for being here. We move refugees by the thousands. And uh, this, again, is a very heartwarming experience for a pilot and those of us on the ground. Uh, because if we didn't move them, they'd be overrun and made prisoners and made bearers by the opposition. We carry rice, we carry food to the people, medical supplies. Rice is dropped in 80-pound sacks. Nearly one quarter of the country's population are displaced persons. Most have fled the communists. Some have fled our bombing of the communists. A quarter of a million people are outright refugees, existing on American handouts. Over 100,000 depend on aerial delivery for survival. Supervising the relief program is a handful of American AID men. They spend most of their time in remote locations like this. It's a measure of the loyalty of the Hill tribes that in 10 years of wandering unarmed through the communist-infested mountains, not a single AID man has been betrayed to the enemy. They are not CIA agents. Their job is to help refugees. But even this function is indirectly linked to the war. If enough refugees flee the enemy, the communists may be left trying to conduct a people's war without people. The aid program also runs hospitals. This one treats over 40,000 people a year. Many of them are flown in by Air America and Continental. 
This little girl was hit by grenade fragments in a remote village. Few Americans object to this sort of American involvement in Laos. But the General Accounting Office reports that much of the AID money Congress thought it was appropriating for civilian health care was being used for medical support of the secret army. Until recently, at least, even deceiving the United States Congress was considered a legitimate tactic of the secret war. The latest North Vietnamese offensive has already created 50,000 new refugees. Most of them are Hmong tribesmen, and for most of them, this is the third time they've been uprooted. At their last location, AID had provided them with homes, schools, and a dispensary. Now they're back to square one, huddled on a bleak hilltop, sheltered by parachutes and scrap lumber. They are both tired of the war and nervous about a peace settlement that would abandon them. In the meantime, they depend on the charter planes for everything. And for the pilots of those planes, landing strips like this are becoming riskier every day. Has this uh, increase in enemy activity and the loss of real estate, has this affected the morale of the pilots? No, I think it's probably made them more cautious. <clears throat> um, it can ruin your whole day if you land at somebody else's airstrip or one that you think is friendly and you find out it isn't the hard way. That very thing recently happened to one Air America pilot. His wrecked aircraft still sits like a squashed bug on the enemy-held airstrip. The people on the airplane talked to uh, people on the ground and they said everything is secure, so I landed. The fellow I had with me, uh, known to me as Swamp Rat, suggested I shut the engines down. So I turned the engine off. And this was uh, one of the <laughs> first mistakes I made that day. The minute that the prop started turning, it stopped turning, they started shooting at us. The first one put holes in the machine, and the uh, swamp rat was already outside the airplane, and he uh, hollered at me, let's, let's go, and this didn't take a lot of encouragement. I, uh, since the airplane was done, it was uh, unwound, well, I leaped out of it, too, and I still, though, was laboring under the illusion that when it's all over, I'm going to get back in my machine and fly out of there. This is what aviators do. They don't walk, they fly. Two days after losing his plane and nearly losing his life, Jim Russell was flying again. The first battle of Long Chen was reaching its climax, and only the performance of the charter planes enabled the secret army to turn almost certain defeat into at least a temporary standoff. Only helicopters could land to pluck out the seriously wounded. North Vietnamese artillery was shelling the airstrip. Enemy snipers were firing up at the planes. Enemy machine guns on the hills were firing down at the planes. But the friendlies were out of water and ammunition, so the planes went in anyway. They shared the narrow airspace with fighter bombers, trying to blast the enemy off the ridgelines. To the charter pilots, it was just another mission. goes in spurts. Uh, last February, for example, when we didn't have so much 
heavy anti-aircraft, we had 27 airplanes hit in one month. In 27 de- airplanes hit in one month? Yes. This December, when the flak was more intense, we had 24 airplanes hit. However, <clears throat> the hits can be more serious because you're dealing with a larger caliber of uh, weapon. But that is part of the challenge, that is part of why we are here. And it's not a, a death wish by any stretch of the imagination. It is a, a little competition with uh, the, other, the other side, huh? And uh, try to survive and use my talents against their talents, and usually it win. Who's complaining, Doc Lonnie? Ah! (laughs) Sorry about that. You got it, Rick. No bloody fair. The favorite watering spot for the oddball warriors of this oddball war is the Purple Porpoise Bar. The clientele includes spooks, military attaches, pilots, and diplomats. There is a better way, you silly son. The pub keeper is a misplaced Englishman who calls himself Monty Banks. He gives away nearly as much booze as he sells, and to make sure his clients can discuss their clandestine business in private, he frequently places his saloon off limits to journalists. I will you every night, dear, I will you every day. I'll be your regular daddy if you put that gun away. Oh, play that pistol down, play, play that pistol down. Pistol back in my mouth, lay that pistol down. How do you cut the barkeep off? Hey, you can break his own liquor. You? Me? Thank you. The Americans that are in this town are the best Americans I've yet met. The people that walk into my bar, the Americans, collectively, are human beings who love humanity. Thank you, honey. Thank you, honey. Legend has it that whenever the city of the Encian was threatened by invaders, the monks of this temple would pray and beat the sacred drum to summon forth a dragon which protected the city. Today, the very existence of Laos is threatened, but there is no dragon to help. Even in the best of times, Laos is a fragile country. The only unifying force is allegiance to the king. Even the communists pay lip service to the throne. But that doesn't keep them from shelling the royal capital. After nearly one billion dollars in American military assistance, the Lao regular army still leaves a lot to be desired. It does not fight well, but it has been fighting a long time. Over one-third of these military academy cadets are children of men killed in action. For the most part, the children of the rich and powerful